to allow people to move seats, but everybody seems to be where they want to be. So we will move on to the next item of business, which is an urgent uh, question. And I call uh, on Jackie Bailey, who is joining us remotely. Ms Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether the Scottish COVID-19 inquiry might be delayed due to the resignation of the Air and Senior Council. Deputy First Minister John Swinney. President Officer, the Scottish Government wants the inquiry to be delivered at speed, addressing the range of questions that people have, particularly the bereaved, so that we can learn and benefit from lessons as early as possible. This is why arrangements for appointing a new judicial chair for the inquiry have been taken forward urgently to ensure a successful transition. The Scottish Government remains committed to the vital work of the inquiry, as is the independent inquiry team, and Lady Poole will continue as chair during a notice period of up to three months. A further update will be provided to Parliament at the earliest possible opportunity. Jackie Bailey. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his response, but I am curious as to why he never mentioned the resignation of four senior and junior counsel when he hosted a cross-party briefing meeting on Monday. Not a word passed his lips. This is a material consideration which should have been disclosed, and I regret the lack of transparency from the government on such an important issue. Some more cynical than I might say that there's a pattern of secrecy here with the government, and I hope that this doesn't spill over into the inquiry itself. The Scottish Government seconds senior staff from the civil service to work in the inquiry, so there is no excuse for not knowing what was going on. When was the Scottish Government told about the concerns and problems that preceded these resignations? Deputy First Minister. Okay. The, the, the first point I want to make is that the Inquiries Act requires that the inquiry is independent of the government. That is the law, and I must obey the law, and I am following the law. Under the 2005 Inquiries Act, ministers have the power to establish an independent public inquiry, to set its terms of reference, and to appoint a chair and a panel. Section 17 of the Inquiries Act 2005 gives an inquiry chair alone, rather than ministers, responsibility for deciding how an inquiry should operate. This includes its approach to taking evidence and engaging with its stakeholders. So that is the legal position that I must follow. Now, I considered carefully what I should share with members of Parliament when I telephoned them on Monday evening to share the information, because I was mindful of my legal obligation to respect the independence of the inquiry. And the staffing matters of the inquiry are exclusively a matter for the chair of the inquiry. So at no stage have I tried to conceal information. I have simply respected the legal framework under which I must operate. In relation to the sequence of events, Lady Poole emailed my office on Friday morning. I spoke to her within minutes of the email being received and Lady Poole intimated to me her decision to step down for personal reasons. Um, in the course of that call, she indicated to me that uh, four members of Council had resigned the previous day from the inquiry. That was news to me, as were the circumstances that led to Lady Poole's resignation when I heard that on Friday morning. Jack Jackie Bailey. I'm sure the Deputy First Minister will agree with me that there will be huge disappointment for the families who are grieving the loss of a loved one to COVID. They deserve answers and they've been patient in waiting for the inquiry to start. Lady Poole was appointed in December, the day before Baroness Hallett was appointed to lead the UK-wide inquiry. The UK-wide inquiry has started and they've made clear that the people affected are at the heart of their consideration. So does the Deputy First Minister agree that it is the Scottish Government's responsibility to ensure that the inquiry system works and is adequately resourced? Can he tell me when the inquiry will start? When will it hear from the families in person? When will the inquiry report? And what is the revised cost now? And above all, how will he ensure that whoever replaces Lady Poole ensures that the families affected are at the very heart of the inquiry's work? Deputy First Minister. President Officer, Jackie Bailey invites me by those questions to break the law. Yep. 
because she invites me to interfere in the running of the inquiry. And I, will, I simply will not do it because I have no intention of breaking Section 17 of the Inquiries Act 2005 because the first person to complain about it would be Jackie Bailey if I was to do that. Now, I... I have listened with enormous care to the bereaved families um, on, on a number of occasions over the course of the establishment of the inquiry. I have taken all the time that they have asked me to engage with them and I will, uh, I will be seeing bereaved families next week. I offered to speak to the three bereaved families groups that um, have made representations to me on Monday. I have spoken to one and I will uh, be in correspondence with another and I will um, see another group next week. Their concerns for me must be at the heart of the inquiry. So Jackie Bailey asks me, what will I do to ensure their voices are at the heart of the inquiry? And that is something I can do. I can insist, when I secure the appointment of judicial leadership for the inquiry, that the point that Jackie Bailey has put to me will be taken on board. It will be a condition of appointment for the judicial leadership that comes in place, that bereaved families must be at the heart of the inquiry. Their issues and their concerns must be properly aired and must be properly addressed. They must have answers, and that will be at the heart of the appointment process of the next judicial leadership. I'll take a few supplementaries. Supplementary, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I was contacted earlier today by a constituent who lost his wife due to COVID and, like many other of the uh, bereaved members of families, has very serious concerns about what has been reported in the media and the potential delays in the inquiry now started to take uh, evidence. Can the Deputy First Minister tell us whether the resignation of Lady Poole was prompted by the resignation of the four uh, senior uh, council members or was it unrelated? Uh, and secondly, can he give us an, an assurance now, none of these resignations have come about because of any political interference in the direction or operation of the inquiry. Deputy First Minister. Um, the, the first point I want to make is, and I hope this was clear from my, answer, my last answer to Jackie Bailey, that the considerations of bereaved families is absolutely central to this inquiry. If there is any group of people in our country who must secure answers in the COVID inquiry, it must be the bereaved families. So I hope that provides reassurance for Mr Fraser to share with his constituent. In relation to the reasons for uh, Lady Poole's resignation, Lady Poole indicated to me that for personal reasons she wished to step down from the inquiry. Those were Lady Poole's words to me and that is, uh, is, is what she has indicated to me. And I don't think it's incumbent on me to explore or examine the rationale for Lady Poole's statements to me. And the final point is frankly one to which I take the greatest of exception because um, I have judiciously followed the contents of the Inquiries Act and particularly Section 17 uh, which guarantees the independence of the inquiry and just for the record there has been absolutely no political interference in the inquiry. Supplementary, Alex Go Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, there isn't a person in this chamber who doesn't know somebody to whom the outcome of this inquiry will make a material life-changing difference and answer vital questions about the loss of their loved ones. Uh, I am concerned about some of the confusion that exists around the departure of Lady Poole. And twice now, the Cabinet Secretary has been asked, firstly, why other opposition spokespeople were not told of the departure of senior and junior counsel at the same time as Lady Poole. Um, and given that the narrative around Lady Poole's departure is that this was for personal reasons, what confidence can we have um, in the narrative around the rest of the inquiry and its status, um, given that this is all starting to fall apart now? I am very concerned. I would be grateful to press the Cabinet Secretary again on this matter. Deputy First Minister. Um, I, I don't know where to start with that question, to be honest, um, because I've just simply stood up in Parliament and made it clear that I am following the law. Yeah. The law requires me to respect the independence of the inquiry. If I was to go around nitpicking about the inquiry, 
which is what Mr Cole Hamilton invites me to do, Mr Fraser would be on his feet accusing me of interference. So can we please respect the fact that this is an independent inquiry? The government has done its bit, which was to appoint a chair and consult and agree a terms of reference. And those terms of reference, as far as I'm aware, from any of the representations I've had across the chamber, are judged to be absolutely appropriate. And across the chamber, everybody took the view that Lady Poole was an appropriate appointment as well. So the two things the government is allowed by law to do, to appoint a chair to the inquiry and to establish terms of reference, have been broadly supported across this chamber. Now, Lady Poole has decided to resign. It is not for me to interfere in the running of the inquiry. My job now is to ask the Lord President, which I have done, to provide nominees for me for replacement judicial leadership and I will resolve the leadership of the inquiry as quickly as I possibly can do. I want to minimise any disruption. I want to minimise any interruption to the proceedings. There are many staff already in the inquiry. Lady Poole will manage the transition and we will continue to advance to ensure that bereaved families and others are able to air the issues they wish to have aired within the public inquiry. And brief supplementary, please, Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is vital that the families and relatives involved have the utmost confidence in the public inquiry and that the process allows for credible answers to be reached. Can the Deputy First Minister provide further assurances that the important progress made so far by the inquiry is continued and that it will be done in a transparent manner that operates independent, independently of ministers? Deputy First Minister. Well, well, I want to stress the point that the inquiry is established on a basis that is independent of government and it will continue to operate independently of government. I want to make sure that, and I think this was broadly understood from the terms of reference, that members of the public who lost loved ones in the COVID inquiry had to have the opportunity to address their concerns and their issues as part of the inquiry and that will be central to the way in which the inquiry proceeds in the days, uh, weeks and months to come. Thank you. That concludes the urgent question. Before we move on to the next item of business, which is a committee of the whole parliament, I suspend this meeting of parliament. Thank you.